Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you're all having an amazing day. I'm coming down with a bit of a plague, so hopefully my voice manages to hold up throughout the video. Uh, but we do have an awful lot of news to get through. And the first piece of news is actually bad news because it concerns the X399 motherboards and incompatibility with the next generation of Threadripper, the third generation. So this is not official news, but it is a leak from Luzmos on Overclock.net. I'd also like to thank several people who emailed me this particular story. So Luzmos is very well known in the AMD community uh, for not only being a pretty hardcore overclocker and developer, but also offering applications like the DRAM calculator for Ryzen, which is also heartily recommended. Um, I'm going to read out his post on overclock.net verbatim. He is from Germany slash Ukraine, so his English is not 100% uh, grammatically correct, but I will read it out verbatim. Unfortunately, this is not very good news. AMD have changed its mind about making X399 compatible with new generation. For this reason, HEDT disappeared from all calendars and the release of these processors was forced to postpone. Since the new processor has a new memory controller and he in a single copy instead of two as before, had to seriously change the pins. Also, the new PCI Gen 4 standard and new power pins made a special contribution. TRX40 and TRX80 are a new generation and a new architecture. Nothing to do with past generation. At the moment, this information is all classified and I do not have access to it. End quote. So there's definitely a lot to take away here. The first thing that I will tackle, because I know some people are going to bring it up, is that AMD promised forwards and backwards compatibility until 2020. And this is definitely true. And do correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I'm pretty certain that they did not promise that with Threadripper. Instead, they promised it with AM4 and the server side of the, the equation. So, for example, if you've got like a X370 motherboard until 2020, you will be good. So Ryzen 4000 will be when uh, AMD's promise ends. So basically with Zen free stuff. When it comes to Threadripper and X399, I don't believe they made that particular promise. And it seems like they are going to be drastically improving the performance of the next generation of Threadripper. And it will also require a different pin uh, layout compared to the existing CPUs. As well as potentially different power drawer as well, given the fact they said new power pins. New power pins usually means a higher power drawer. Um... I know this is going to be disappointing for owners of X399, but I kind of figured that this would be the case because there have been so many rumors that we will see uh, like a very different approach for the next generation of HEDT. TRX40 is rumored to be essentially a replacement for the existing generation of X399, whereas TRX80 is said to be much more workstation-like. Uh, there's been multiple rumours about that, and uh, I've gone through them in depth in the past, so I don't want to go over old ground again and again and again. But essentially, the workstation variant is said to be up to 64 cores with 8-channel memory and lots more I.O., and the uh, I guess the TRX40 platform is said to be only 32 cores, although the core counts, of course, are not confirmed, and only quad-channel memory and also lower I.O., but either way, you can't really say any variant of Fred Ripper is exactly mediocre. Let's just be totally blunt. Uh, another reason I really find this post interesting is, for a while, Fred Ripper was removed from several AMD roadmaps, and AMD weren't really talking about it, which led people to speculate that Fred Ripper was done and dusted, and then AMD quickly said, no, 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 that's not the case. It's just that we're not ready to talk about it yet. So maybe, and this is pure speculation, they were just like in the back kind of tinkering. And eventually they realised, yeah, we kind of just need to, uh, say, chop this in half and just kind of start again. I'm looking forward to seeing what both platforms are capable of, as well as the pricing of both platforms, as well as how they choose to market them. 
Uh, and this does bring us actually to a couple of other pieces of AMD news, the first of which is the 3900. No, I'm not in a time warp of several months, but we are talking about a 12-core 65-watt derivative of this processor. Um, so, as we are probably aware, the 3900X launched uh, with a TDP of 105 watts and launched in July uh, with the price point of 499 US dollars. But the 3900 retains the same core count, 12 cores, 24 threads, but the base frequency and boost frequency are lower. So we have 3.1 gigahertz compared to 3.8 and 4.2 compared to 4.6. The TDP is 65 watts, although the launch date as well as pricing are unknown. So it's going to be curious how AMD chooses to market this, whether it's going to purely be for OEM usage or whether we're going to see uh, it available on the broader market. But yeah, um, not quite sure who is going to buy this if it, we're talking about overclockers uh, because obviously the lower clock speed, I think uh, enthusiasts probably might give this CPU a miss. But I suspect it may be more uh, of interest for people who are, buy, are building like a slimmer line system or for maybe system integrators. But of course, it could also be price dependent as well. And next piece of news for AMD and the final piece for today is Zen 3. Because there is yet another report online that Zen 3 will support four threads um, thanks to SMT4. This Rumour has uh, been reignited with the website hardwarelux.de. So, just so we're abundantly clear here, SMT4 is not some mythical thing that's never been done. We've actually had IBM and the Power architecture, which has actually supported up to 8 execution threads per core. And indeed, Intel have done it as well with, Zen with uh, Xeon Phi. So, this is not like impossible or anything like that. It really comes down to the number of execution units as well as other things that are in the back uh, end of the processor. So for example how well the CPU does at predicting the next instruction that's going to be coming along. Uh, are we going to see bumps in the cache sizes and so on and so on and so on. Uh, so it's certainly not impossible for them to do this but there is definitely a lot of conflicting information with Zen 3. From my own sources, some people have told me, yes, it does support SMT4. Others have told me, no, it doesn't. And the more reliable sources that I've had, for example, the ones that told me the July 7th release date back in the day, they've basically just kind of shuffled awkwardly when I've asked them those questions and haven't said one way or the other. The other fact you have to remember as well is let's for a moment say that it does feature SMT3 and I'm not saying, it, sorry, SMT4 and I'm not saying it does but let's just assume for a moment it does. That does not mean that Ryzen 4000 will have this. It could be relegated purely to uh, Milan which is of course the third generation of... Um, Epic processors, which is a very good possibility, because let's say uh, the Ryzen 4000 has this, I don't really think it's going to benefit the average consumer. Uh, so I suspect that this is going to be one of those ways that AMD differentiates the consumer variants versus like CPUs that are designed purely for HPC. As for the fourth generation of Threadripper, it may depend upon the usage scenario, so maybe the workstation variant will have it, whereas the you know creative version won't have it. Who knows? I personally am kind of on the fence with this one because I've had so many different things. It's definitely possible, though, that Zen 3 is going to be pretty impressive. The design is actually complete. Hopefully, we get some early benchmarks or some really concrete leaks concerning Zen 3. AMD themselves did actually uh, confirm one of the rumours that I heard from one of my sources that it's going to be very comparable in terms of power efficiency compared to Intel's uh, Sunny Cove 
based uh, processors, uh, very comparable, basically power versus um, performance wise anyway. But obviously at the end of the day, that doesn't really tell us what's changed underneath the hood for uh, Zen 3. So it's going to be very interesting to see how next year, or well, actually over the next couple of years, shapes up. And don't forget Zen 3 uh, Milan is also going to be the final processor which does have backwards compatibility. So AM4's roadmap essentially is done at that point uh, with Zen 3 and Ryzen 4000, as is Rome. There are some people who have also said that maybe we don't get Zen 3. Maybe we don't get Zen 3 and it's only for server market. And instead we get some type of Zen 2 refresh if Zen 3 has SMT4. I don't necessarily subscribe to that point of view. I think we will get Zen 3 for the uh, next generation Ryzen CPUs. I just don't believe we will get SMT4 for the next generation Ryzen CPUs. That is even if this rumor is true and I'm kind of on the fence whether it is or not. And next up we have some Intel pieces of news, the first of which is Intel's Comet Link S CPU development kits have actually been registered with the EEC. And this is very interesting because it confirms that we are looking at a 10 core processor uh, from Intel and it will be using the same 14nm process that we've seen previously. So essentially the same processors, both the 8th and ninth generation and of course it's going to have a similar architecture. What we don't know based upon this information is the clock frequency. The registration itself was released on the 24th of this month which is September so now the chips are essentially heading for qualification so now the chips may be in the hands of partners because they're obviously going to be wanting to test the chips out see what they're capable of. Unfortunately we don't really know at the end of the day, how these CPUs are going to fare against the 3900X or the 3950X. And I've said this once and I'll say it many more times, I think it's going to heavily depend upon what clock frequencies that Intel can squeeze out of it, particularly all core, but also the pricing. If, for example, Intel can get 5 gigahertz all core, uh, or even 5.1 gigahertz all core, with a 10 core CPU with a 10 core CPU and charge like 500 bucks for gaming it may be a really good processor and potentially be a better buy for gaming focused individuals than the 3900x but if they are going to be running all of those cores at like 4. I don't know 4.6 gigahertz and they're going to charge like 600 bucks for it then obviously it's going to be very difficult to recommend a 10 core Comet Lake CPU when it's going to be presumably competing with the 3950X. So to me it's going to all come down to the clock frequency as well as the price of the CPU. Oh and speaking of clock frequency versus pricing we have the 9900KS and it has actually been listed online for 600 US dollars which is quite a lot of monies. So just if you're unfamiliar with the 9900KS, and I think most of you probably are, it is a special edition 9900K. So things like the uh, number of CPU cores, the fact it has hyper-threading, the amount of cash, blah, 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 all of that is identical. The only difference is that all of the CPU cores run at 5 gigahertz. Uh, but Momomo on Twitter has actually found out that the CPU, according to one retailer, is hitting 600 US dollars, which I think is a little too expensive. I'm not too convinced that people are going to want to cough that up. The only reason that you might be willing to pay that is if it overclocks like a demon. I presume, although I don't have any evidence because obviously I don't have the CPU, but I presume it's going to overclock better than a standard 9900K. Frankly though, I don't think I'd cough this amount of money up for a 9900K uh, S. I would rather either just buy a regular vanilla 9900K because, well, quite frankly, that hits 5 gigahertz without too much of a problem, or I would just save it and buy a 3950X, or I would just save up and see what happens with Comet Lake next year, or presumably, presumably at least is next year anyway, 
and see how that fares against uh, AMD's latest and greatest. So the final piece of news for today, because I think it's the final thing that I can record without my voice breaking, quite frankly, is the GTX 1660 Super. Yes, a 1660 Super. Uh, we already have the 1660 Ti, which is using the TU-116-400 core, and has GDDR6 memory clocked at 12 Gbps and has 1536 cores. We have the GTX 1660 Vanilla, which is a TU-116-300 core, which has GDDR5 memory with 6 gigabytes of 6 gigabytes of memory with 1408 cores. So take a guess what the 1660 Super is. That's right, TU-116, so it looks like it's pretty much the same core as the 1660 because it has an identical core count, but the difference here lies in the memory configuration. So it has 6 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory, so that's identical to the GTX 1660 Ti, but it actually has faster memory than the 1660 Ti. So this is just ridiculous, because you've got the 1660, which has 1408 cores, which is identical to the Super, but the 1660 Ti has 1536 cores, which is fewer than the Super, but has 12 GBPS memory versus 14 GBPS memory. And don't forget as well, the, the rumour is that we're also going to see the launch of a GTX 1650 Ti, which is going to have between 1024 to maybe 1152 CUDA cores, although we don't know what the memory configuration is. Personally, I think a couple of those SKUs are going to become end of line, because otherwise it wouldn't really make sense. I, I suspect, and I could be totally wrong, but I suspect we may see the 1660 vanilla as well as potentially the 1650 vanilla become end of line and then basically the 1650 Ti replaces the 1650 and then the 1660 Super replaces the 1660 vanilla. The only thing I can say about this other than really confusing is that it may be a sign that Nvidia are concerned about what AMD are doing with the uh, lowest end Nave SKUs. But at the end of the day, this is super confusing for consumers, so it's going to be very interesting to see what NVIDIA do here. The other thing about the lower end segment of the GPU market um, is that it's very easy to spend just a few more dollars, like 20, 30 more dollars, and get quite a lot, uh, quite a lot more performance for your money which is very good for kind of nudging you to say, well, it's only like an extra 30 or $40 and I'll get this many more frames per second. Well, you know what? Rather than buying a 16, 6, 1660, I'll go for the 1660 Ti. It's only X amount more money. And then, of course, you could look at the 1660 Ti and say to yourself, well, I could just go and buy the RTX 2060 instead because that's even more performance and that way I get to mess around with some of the new Turing features like ray tracing or whatever so it's a really interesting mindset that people have with this performance tier of gpus i'm very much looking forward to seeing what amd do in terms of the pricing so hopefully uh it's a good sign that amd will be very competitive in the lower end SKUs. but anyway i think that's just about it for this particular video so hopefully you've enjoyed it if you did then the normal stuff like share comment and subscribe and i'll see you soon take care of yourselves Bye for now.